Okay, listen, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I suppose you've heard now from Heinz and from Connie about the, the global kind of European perspective. My task, I suppose, is to bring that down to the Irish perspective. Um, but I think it's important to say that we're not just pass passive recipients of all of this. You know, we are very active in Europe, um, both in NSOE. Uh, you know, we, we, we were a founder member of the previous organization, ETSO, and we're very active in all of the committees. So we're, we're, out, we're out there influencing the development of all of this. And certainly also in the Commission, and um, I know our department and our minister has been very active in terms of shaping the policy that, uh, that uh, is ahead of us. Because this concerns all citizens right across Europe. Now, if I could just learn to use the technology, it's just left and right here, is it? In the middle. Yeah. And usually middle. Point it. Point it. Point it. Yeah. And down. There we go. That's great. Okay, maybe just to start off and looking at the status, uh, the current status of renewables on the island. And I suppose here I'm focusing on wind. There's a small amount of hydro, but just on wind. And we have currently connected about 1,480 megawatts. Uh, and I'm talking here about the Republic of Ireland. Obviously, Northern Ireland has over 300 megawatts already connected as well. Um, of that 1,479, roughly 50% is connected at distribution level and 50% at transmission level. But it all affects us as system operators because on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to operate a power system with that much uh, variable wind. And I'll talk about the, the challenges that that uh, pr presents uh, to us. And interestingly enough, we had a very interesting day yesterday with you know, winds of 130 kilometers per hour up in the north of the country. And uh, so the system was well and truly tested yesterday. And it stood up well, I have to say. Uh, obviously, some wind farms disconnected out because of the high, very high, high wind speeds. But again, the geographical dispersity, even on the small island of Ireland, helped us in terms of kind of managing our way through that. So we did see significant ups and downs during the day, but nothing that we weren't able to handle. Um, in addition to that, we also have contracted and being built out there another just over 1,100 megawatts. So that brings us to about 25, 2600 megawatts of wind that is either in, in commission or being developed. Um, and in gate three then, which is the next phase of connection offers, which we are in the middle of at the moment together ourselves and ESB networks, we will be issuing a total of 3,900 megawatts of offers. So potentially that brings us to 6,500 megawatts of wind uh, on a system that has an average load of about you know, 4,000 by 2020. The peak load is a bit higher than that. Um, so uh, it just shows you, I suppose, the scale of the task that we as system operators have uh, on the island. Uh, basically, we have three main tasks. One is to connect the wind. Two, we have to then uh, develop the grid that gets the wind to market, basically. And three, we have to operate a system with you know, a variable uh, intermittent uh, resource. Uh, and maybe just to put that in perspective, um, and looking ahead to 2020. So the 2020 target on the island now, both in the ROI and also most recently in Northern Ireland, is 40%. So we have, a, we have an aligned target of 40% renewables by 2020. And you can see there um, what that means for Ireland. We have a small amount of hydro, so wind about 37%. But that picture doesn't really tell the story um, because on the island of Ireland, and I don't want to get too technical now, but some of you will understand this, we have a small, what's called a synchronous system on the island of Ireland, a synchronous system. And uh, I suppose the key uh, ratio then is how our wind, uh, wind which is asynchronous, so uh, the, the, the technology of wind is very different than the conventional power plants on the system. They are asynchronous, working on a synchronous system. So the size of the synchronous system and the relative amounts of asynchronous generation on that system are critically important. So uh, in Europe, we have uh, five synchronous systems. We have uh, two smaller islands, Cyprus and Malta. We have mainland Europe, basically the, what's called the UCTE uh, network. We have no, uh, the Nordic countries, uh, Scandinavia, and we have the UK. So sorry, that's six altogether. But you can see there what the target means relative to the size of the synchronous system. And the challenge, I suppose, that we're faced because our target is that much more than the rest of Europe. So what that means is that we have to be very innovative. And that innovation, in turn, will, I think, uh, we will hit those issues before any other synchronous system. 
So other countries then will be looking to what we're doing here, and that's already happening. And we had a very interesting, for example, discussion here last week with Stephen Chu, the Secretary for Energy in the States, who was really interested in the things we are doing to facilitate that level of penetration on the system. Um, just an example, that's a, a, a typical week. That was a week earlier in September. Uh, this is the, uh, the um, megawatts of wind on the system um, going from very low levels up to very high levels there. You can see up to uh, just over 1,000 megawatts there at one point. Um, and I suppose what's interesting is when we get to the 40% target, 40% target we need to have about 4,600 megawatts connected. We currently have about, uh, as I said, 1,500, just less than 1,500. So for 2020, we need three times the amount of wind on the system than we currently have to meet our 40% target. So uh, again, you can picture then what you know, that rise would look like if you multiply it by three. Uh, and they're the kind of situations, I suppose, that the control center engineers on a day-to-day -day basis have to face when they're, when they're looking at that level of variability. Um, if I can just, uh, on the bottom left-hand curve here, you can see that same graph and I've superimposed on it in red what the level of penetration is for that level of megawatts on the system in that week. And you can see here it's rising up above 45% at times. Now, we have already hit 50%, and we've actually had to curtail a, a small amount to keep it at 50%, um, because the dynamic characteris characteristics are so different. So the key issue then for us is if we have to get to 40%, how do we stretch that envelope beyond the 50% instantaneous penetration, because 40% is an average over the year, and the wind blows, it doesn't blow, so if you're 40% average, you have to get to much higher levels of instantaneous penetration. And that was really the, 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 the challenge uh, that we, we are looking at. And we have undertaken, um, over the past two years, we've undertaken a major, I believe, a groundbreaking study looking at uh, you know, the, the, the stability of the system with higher levels of penetration to see exactly where we can go and where we, where we can't go. Um, and I'll just pay tribute to John O'Sullivan because I know John's dad is here, so. Um, <laughs> he did fantastic work on this and um, he led this project and I think it really is groundbreaking. Um, and you can see here on the right-hand side then, I suppose this is the fundamental finding from that study that you know, at the moment we can go to 50%, which is the green area there. Um, we have, uh, through the various studies that we've done, we, we, we have determined that we can go to 75%. Now, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have a lot of work to do with ESB networks in terms of um, protection on distribution-connected uh, wind farms and other work. But we, we're confident that we'll be able to push that envelope out to, out to about 75%. Beyond that, we haven't figured it out yet. That's, but let's, let's worry about the 75% for the moment. And we are doing a lot of things in terms of, um, uh, in, t in terms of how do we operate this in the system. Uh, so for example, we have online dispatch of wind farms. The controllers can send a signal directly to a wind farm to get it to kind of shut down or close down or reduce load. Uh, um, we have, uh, obviously we have remote control facilities across all our critical transmission assets. Forecasting is really important that the, the guy in the control, the guy or the girl in the control center is looking at tomorrow and how am I going to dispatch the, the power system tomorrow has to have a good idea of what the forecast of wind is going to be tomorrow because that allows them to make you know, rational decisions about how much reserve to keep, etc. Um, and as I say, you know, there's a lot of learning by doing here, but uh, we will get to the 75%. And, I suppose the, 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 the great thing is the 75% instantaneous allows us to get to 40% average across the year without too much curtailment, or a very small amount of curtailment. Um, the, second, or the third big challenge we have, I suppose, is then to get the wind from where it's generated to market. And, and this is really where Grid25, uh, which is our grid development strategy, uh, comes in. Uh, we launched this back in the end of 2008. Um, it isn't just for wind, it's also to make sure that you know, when, the, when the economy turns, which it will do, that every region and every county in this country is able to participate in that upturn. Because at the end of the day, it's about jobs and making sure that we have the infrastructure. And I certainly don't want to be pointed at as, as ha not having de developed the grid, and the grid then is a barrier to that economic uh, regeneration. 
So Grid 25 is about all of those things, but I suppose we're focusing here on renewables. And I suppose this is mirroring, mirroring what both uh, Heinz and, 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 and Connie have said. You know, this is true in every country right across Europe, developing the grid. The grid is central to getting those renewables uh, to market. Um, our strategy uh, involves, uh, maybe just to put it in context, we have about, about 6,000 kilometers of, of transmission grid. Uh, so the, the, the first thing we need to do is to upgrade as much of that as possible. So we're talking about upgrading 2,200 kilometers of that grid. Um, this year alone, we've upgraded 300 kilometers of it. Um, and we have identified a new technology that's going to help us to speed that up and do it at much less cost. And that's being tested and, and being implemented this year on, on one particular line. And we will be rolling that out. And that is going to save hundreds of millions. Um, but we do have to have some new build especially into parts of the country that don't have a grid, like, for example, Mayo or some of the, some of the areas in the southwest. Um, uh, we put a price tag of about $4 billion on it. Um, as I say, it's a strategy at the moment. It's not a plan. We're working with the, 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 pl the plan uh, is implemented um, through kind of five-year chunks. And I do want to pay, pay tribute to the, the Commission for Energy Regulation in terms of their support for Grid 25. And I can say categorically that we have the support we need from the CR. And uh, I, um, I think we're talking about 1.45 billion of that 4 billion over the next five years. So that is enough to get us kind of up and running and get us, uh, get us moving. Um, some of the, uh, I suppose, well, maybe first of all to say that Crew 25 is already being implemented out there. There's a lot of work on the ground in terms of upgrading lines, in terms of new line build. This year alone, we'll have built 150 kilometers of 110 kb line. Uh, that goes, it goes, goes, goes ahead kind of under the radar, um, but a huge amount of work in terms of ramping up Grid 25. Um, some of the bigger projects then are the ones that I suppose are, will be in the pub, in more in the public domain. And these are some of the ones that we have to bring into the consultation process next year. Some of the main corridors, you've already seen some of these maybe on the seven year, on the, sorry, on the, on the TINDIP plan. Um, but, uh, and really it's because of where the resource is. The resource is on the west coast, the northwest, and on the southwest, and we have to get that to market. Um, we also then, uh, you know, the, the, the east-west interconnector, an interconnection, and you've heard Connie and you've heard Heinz talking about the need to integrate Ireland and the rest of Europe uh, to create the single internal market. And um, this is critical for renewables because it provides the, uh, I suppose, the, uh, you know, when, when, when high level of renewables in the system and the load is low, we can export and vice versa. So we already have the Moyle interconnector between Northern Ireland and Scotland. Uh, we are building currently the east-west interconnector. And again, I want to um, pay tribute to uh, the Commission uh, through the economic recovery plan for the 110 million that we have got uh, from, as a grant from Europe for this. Um, and I have to say, um, Heinz, that this is critical, that the support is there for this type of of, of investment because you talked about the leverage that it brings and we have felt that very strongly. We have, on the back of that, we were able to get 50% uh, funding from the European Investment Bank at very competitive rates and we were also then able to go to the commercial banks for the balance. And uh, the, the very fact that Europe is there saying this is of European significance gives the credibility to companies like Airgrid to go to the banks and it gives the banks confidence that this is uh, critically important. <coughs> so that kind of support, and I'm sorry to hear you didn't have the numbers here with you today on the, uh, on the, on the, the support, the financial supports, but you will hear them in due course. Um, we are on target for 2012. In, in Wales, we have something like 90% of the ducks in the roads, in, in the 35 kilometers on the roads in Wales. Uh, we are putting the cable, laying the cable into those ducks at the moment. We are working in Ireland here. We're a bit behind because of planning issues here in Ireland, but we are on target for 2012, so that work is ongoing. Um, but in all of this, uh, we have a major construction challenge, and the real challenge for us, us as a nation, and us certainly in Airgrid and ESB Networks, is getting the balance right. And the balance really is between the reliability of the grid that we have, the cost of that and the affordability of it, and the impact that it has on, on communities and on the environment. And that is a very difficult balance to get right, but that is really the, the critical task. Um, 
looking beyond the east-west interconnector and looking at some of the kind of the, the, out beyond 2020, because the world doesn't end in 2020, we are also looking at further interconnection and a case for further interconnection. And we have done a, an economic evaluation of that, which is on our website. And we have shown that there is a, an economic case for further interconnection between Ireland to Great Britain or perhaps to France. And uh, this year now we'll be looking at maybe taking that to the next pre-feasibility pre stage. Um, we're also doing work uh, as part of the NSOE. And uh, in NSOE, we are part of the, uh, uh, this shows the 10-year network development plan that Connie has already talked about. But I, I want to just talk about work we are doing as part of the North Seas group within NSOE. And here, the 10 countries of the North Seas uh, are looking at how do we harness, for the benefit of Europe Power Group, how do we harness the tremendous wind, onshore, offshore, and, and, and ocean uh, resource that we have and make it available uh, into, into Europe. Uh, and we're, uh, we're very active in this in, in Airgrid. We're a part of this group, but we're also doing the modeling. We're one of the four countries doing the modeling. Uh, and um, what we're showing here is, uh, in, in, in green, we're showing the existing interconnections between those countries. In the kind of purple color, we're showing the interconnections that will be there in 2020. And you can see here then the, um, what we call the copper plate or the potential supergrid, which effectively is if you have infinite interconnection. And we want to find out what would the flows be for different scenarios. So um, I'm just going to show one of, the, one of the early results out of that. Uh, you, it's down here on the right-hand side for Ireland. And basically, you can see for those three different interconnection scenarios, you know, existing interconnection, uh, EWIC, and, uh, and, and the, the copper plate, you can see the increase in, for example, in wind here on the right-hand side, the high bars. So as the interconnection increases, we're able, to, um, we're able to accommodate more wind. Or let me put it a different way, we're able to con we, we, have, we, we, we have to constrain the wind less. So there is greater production of wind. Um, on those interconnectors, there is a very significant import and export. Um, we're showing here the net, uh, the net uh, import on the bottom right-hand side. Great. Nearly there. Um, again, to come back to public acceptability, um, both Heinz and, and, and Connie have talked about our planning system in Ireland. We do have a one-stop shop. Uh, it is in the early days, but it's proving, I think, to be, it will prove to be very effective. But as I said at a recent, uh, recent workshop in, in, in the EU Parliament, um, having that is a necessary but not sufficient condition it's really critical that we get public acceptability. And we all have to work at that. That's not just an issue for Airgrid, it's an issue for Ireland Inc. Uh, and that is, I suppose, maybe the, my, uh, my, my last message. Okay, thank you. Thank you.